Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is the first of the uh, Aberdeen Maritime Branch technical sessions for 2021. Uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, for joining. Wish you all a happy new year. Uh, I hope you had a good festive period and are ready for a brand new year of uh, Aberdeen Maritime Branch uh, technical talks. Uh, today, we've got an excellent uh, talk happening. I'm really looking forward to hearing from James and, uh, and his team at XOcean and the work that they do. And uh, I think for myself, it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, to really kind of showcase some of the great things that are happening in uh, sort of uh, naval architecture, in the marine systems, and also the, the, um, the areas of autonomous surface vessels. So it's really gonna be an exciting uh, talk. What I want to make sure though, you guys as the crowd, your audience, you're the ones that are really going to bring this to life. You know, uh, it's your questions that are going to be the things that really drive the conversation. And uh, having spoken to James offline uh, prior to coming on here, what we really, we, we really want is for the audience out there to get involved. So you'll have notifications about uh, Slido and how you can ask questions. So really what I'm imploring you to do is to listen uh, to, the, to the presentation and as things come up, start writing down those questions. Uh, we'll be looking at them in the background. So by the time James finishes uh, his talk, and I'm sure he'll be, he'll be tired of hearing his own voice. We won't be, but he might have. And, uh, but what we can do at that point then is, is really delve into some of the questions that you answer. And that's where we'll get some of the really great content out of uh, tonight's presentation. So what I would encourage you to do is, uh, is keep thinking about those questions and keep putting them in there. It's uh, James uh, is a great presenter and, and it's a great topic. So let's not waste this opportunity. So um, I'll uh, give you a little bit of an overview. Um, now, I guess the Aberdeen Maritime Branch, we've, uh, we've come back into the new year, so a few changes within the committee. Uh, just to let you know that Ren Jeff, who was our chair, has now stepped down. So I really wanted to thank Ren Jeff for his two years of excellent service. He remains a part of the committee, which is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, myself as vice chair has moved up to chair now, and uh, Gianni has now come in as, uh, as vice chair. So it's um, a couple of different moving parts in the committee, but, uh, but the nucleus remains the same. Uh, one of the great additions we have as well at the moment is uh, Jack has joined as one of our student uh, committee members. So that's really going to try and bring in some of the, that, that youthful enthusiasm into the committee, but also uh, extend out some of uh, the works that we're doing with, um, with the universities and the student population as well. But more of that uh, to come later on. Right now, I don't want to take any more time away uh, from James and his presentation. What I will do is give a little bio, uh, which is always uh, mandatory in these things. So James has thankfully provided it. So I'm going to say James is a founder and CEO of XOcean. James is previously the CEO of an international marine energy business. He is passionate about technology and leading advocate for the safe and sustainable collection of ocean data. So with that, it's over to you, James. Great. Thanks very much, John. And uh, just uh, do let me know if you can't hear me or can't see my slides at any point and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at that. So, um, so look, as I say, thanks, John, for inviting me to speak today. Um, my aim is, is to not present for too long and to give plenty of time for questions and get into a bit of a discussion. Um, in terms of the topics that I wanted to cover today, really four things. Uh, first of all, a little bit of an overview of, I guess, what we're trying to do at XOcean using unmanned systems. To talk a little bit about the technical side, the operation of the systems, how, how do they work? How do they function? Um, touch on a little bit about regulation um, and where that is today and, and, and where is it going? And, and then probably to finish up with probably the most interesting thing, I think, which is around the case studies. So some of the, some of the use cases we've put this technology to uh, around the world and to share some examples and some feedback we've got from those. So that's really the, the, the uh, the topics that I wanted to cover today. So I guess jumping, jumping straight into it, um, first of all, we at XOcean, we actually see ourselves not as a technology company or a survey company, we actually see ourselves as a data company. Ultimately, the thing that we uh, provide to our, our customers is data. Um, and we look to do that very differently. We look to do that on basically a sort of data purchase, a turnkey basis. But as, as really is the, the essence of today, we do it differently. Instead of using 
conventional vessels with a crew on board, we, we use fully unmanned systems. And, and really the nub of why we, why we use these systems is, is for three main reasons. First of all, safety. I mean, clearly the less people that are offshore, the more people that are removed from that potentially hazardous environment. And, and that for a lot of our clients is, is really their number one corporate objective. It's really a key, a key requirement. The second one, which is equally important today, which is really around emissions. So our USV will use around about nine litres of diesel per 24 hours. So, you know, compared to a large survey vessel, which we're using nine tonnes, that's around a thousandth of the fuel consumption. So, you know, we've got really, really low amounts of, of carbon emissions. And what we actually do is we actually offset any carbon that we use in delivering this data to our clients. So effectively, the data we deliver is, is carbon neutral. Um, and then ultimately, it, uh, crucially important is around the economics. Um, we believe we can deliver the data at, at a lower cost at a significant savings. So ultimately, if we can combine a safer operation, a lower carbon operation and, and economic savings, that, that really hits a lot of the, the, key, uh, the key notes for, for, for data collection. So a little bit of, uh, a little bit of well, who, you know, I guess, who have we delivered data for and, and where in the world have we delivered this data? Um, broadly, we could divide our customer base up into three groups. Um, there's oil and gas companies, um, and that's doing things such as uh, uh, doing surveys such as integrity inspections on pipelines. Um, there's government agencies, so a lot of that is civil hydrography work, so, so collecting data that's used for the hydrographic charts. And, and then ultimately there's then industrial groups and, and this is largely offshore wind. Um, and where have we delivered these projects? So uh, our first projects were, were in the UK, we're in the North Sea, and, and today we still do a large amount of work in, in, in UK waters. We currently have one of our US visas currently about 50 nautical miles offshore in the North Sea, uh, actually doing a pipeline survey. But we've then grown uh, beyond the UK. Um, we've operated in various parts around Europe, so such as Norway. Um, we've operated out in Turkey and Azerbaijan, in, in the Celtic Sea, in Germany. Um, when we cross over to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, operated in both in both Canada and the US, so Gulf of Mexico, and then down into the Caribbean in places such as Trinidad and Aruba. So what we're seeing is uh, really an international pool for this type of solution. Um, next stop for us clearly is, is to start completing projects uh, out in Asia Pacific. So, uh, and we've got some projects in the pipeline there. So getting into the more of the technology of the system. Um, so we actually have multiple vessels in our, in our USB fleet. We currently have nine of, of what we call our XO450 uh, USBs. These are four and a half meter uh, vessel. Uh, it's a surface vessel. Um, it's primarily a, a hybrid power plant, so it has a solar array on its deck. It then has a lithium ion battery, and then we also have a small diesel generator to top up the battery. So then everything else is electric, so electric propulsion, um, and of course all the systems are electric. And then we use a satellite uh, connection uh, to give us communication, a permanent broadband connection to the system. Um, and but when we move closer to shore, we can then switch over to using sort of terrestrial services such as 3 and 4G, uh, where there's areas where there's strong signals. So, uh, so we've got a sort of a hybrid connection there. I guess ultimately, when we designed this system, there were, there were really, the key thing that we wanted to design it around was actually the sensors that we want to use. So we're looking to collect you know, commercial grade data and a lot of these sensors there, they, they can be quite large physically, but also they can have quite a high power demand. So we designed the system to have 100 kilograms of payload, uh, and that's the sensor technology, and also around three kilowatts of usable power. Um, so we could, we could power quite large uh, systems. The next thing we really wanted to achieve was, was what's termed over the horizon operations. So this is the ability for the vessel to go offshore go a long way from line of sight and to operate for multiple days without the need for a mothership to be standing by, without the need to have a, a sort of an escort to the vessel. And really the only way we can achieve that is using satellite communications, um, which, uh, which, is, which is what we've, what we've implemented on every vessel. 
And then probably the third key feature we wanted was around efficiency. Um, we wanted to be able to transport this vessel really anywhere in the world. Um, just before Christmas, we finished a project with multiple uh, vessels out in Canada, um, out in the Northern Great Lakes, um, uh, to simulate Arctic conditions out there. Um, we were able to put a couple of the USBs uh, into shipping containers, ship them over to, to Canada, and then basically launch them in an operate over there for, uh, for, for a, a number of weeks. So that ability to move the vessels around freely is, is really been a key, a key feature of it. Um, in terms of the, I guess, the size and the weight of the vessel, it's around the size of an average uh, car, about half the weight, um, relatively slow. So we're typically operating in that three to four knot speed range. So relatively slow compared to conventional vessels, really good for, for getting really high data quality. So surveying at that speed is, is actually an advantage. Um, but ultimately, we don't have a crew on board that uh, that maybe uh, needing to get uh, get home, needing to do crew changes. For us, if the vessel stays out for a bit longer, that's not such an issue for us. So, so typically, we focus on really high data quality over the length of the missions. A little bit of the anatomy of the vessel. Um, so we start off with a, a gantry where we have a whole array of, of sensors and equipment. So everything from fixed cameras through to uh, thermal cameras, a, a PTZ camera that uh, pan, uh, tilt and zoom. Um, we have a series of antennas for, for various, uh, various receptions. Uh, we also have navigational lights. Um, then at the rear of the vessel, we have a satellite transceiver. We've used both uh, Iridium and Inmarsat. Uh, and I think one of the comments I'd make about this sort of technology is, is that there's a number of enabling technologies that are coming through really, really fast. So, so even in the last you know, couple of years that we've been operating our system, there's been huge advances in satellite technology. Um, we're now operating at much higher speeds and at lower costs than we were two years ago. Um, then you start to look at uh, you know, some of the new innovations coming along, you know, uh, Elon Musk's new uh, uh, system, where we're potentially going to get you know, high speed broadband anywhere in the globe. So, you know, the, the speed of change in some of the enabling technologies is, is, really, is really key. And then that same feature follows through to, for example, the power system. So the availability of, of, you know, of high reliability, marine grade, lithium ion batteries, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to source off the shelf um, uh, proven electric thrusters. Um, all of these enabling technologies have really helped us get this technology put together and get it to sea and, and to make it reliable. In terms of the hull form, it's a little bit un unconventional. It's, it's primarily a catamaran, so we have two quite fine main hulls. Um, they're designed specifically to be wave piercing. We don't want the vessel to react too much to the sea around it, so to keep the vessel as stable as possible. And ultimately, it's a very wet, it's a very wet boat. Um, the decks are constantly awash, but that doesn't matter. We have no people on board. We have no concerns about that. So, uh, so two very fine main hulls. And then we have a third hull, uh, which is probably better described as a, a pod rather than a hull. And that's where we put a, a lot of the, the heavier, bulkier items, the batteries, the fuel, um, the, the, the diesel generator. So it's very, it's got very low center of gravity, and it's uh, and it's very central to the uh, to the vessel. Um, and as I mentioned, it's electric propulsion. Um, and then within each of the main hulls, we have on one side we have a survey bay where we can put all of the the, the equipment that's required for the sensor array. And then we also have a the brain of the vessel, the uh, the, the control system in the other hull. So um, it's um, it's a relatively unconventional layout. Um, but we have sent this vessel out into quite extreme conditions. Uh, as I say, we're 50 nautical miles offshore with one of our vessels uh, surveying at the moment. And we've been out into the central North Sea. We've been out into far out in the Atlantic off Canada. Um, we find that even though it's a small vessel, it's, uh, it, it has very, very good sea keeping qualities. So a little bit more about the sensors themselves. Um, Ultimately, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that we're able to carry commercial grade sensors. Um, and here's a couple of examples that, we, that we've carried on, on the left hand image. We actually have two R2 Sonic 2024 multi-beam systems. They're actually uh, placed back to back. 
and actually at an angle for this this particular configuration we were looking to do very high uh, uh, high resolution surveys of some pipelines um, and so what we were doing here was we were angling the multi beam so we could we could pass along one side of the pipeline looking in in from one side and then we would come back on the other side and look from the other side and then stitch that those two data sets together um, that gave us a hugely high resolution um, uh, detail of the pipeline and, and look for any uh, any issues for the asset integrity team. Um, we're also we have a winch on the system, so we're able to do sound velocity casts. We can also use the system for doing things like drop down cameras or, or to attach other sensors onto the system. Um, but ultimately, um, the aim here is is to have a very flexible platform that allows really any sensor system to be in integrated with it and then that allows us to use the right tool for the right the right data collection task so i guess moving a bit closer to the operation of the vessel um, and this is i think really important when we start looking at what's the role the future role of mariners so the way we operate our system probably the thing i should be very clear about it's not an autonomous system it's not we don't just launch it, walk away and, and come back a week later and, and hope it's returned. We're constantly in control of monitoring this vessel. So the way it works is we have this permanent satellite broadband connection to it. And we're getting effectively three feeds of data to our control room uh, coming through. Uh, the first one is, is camera images. So we're, we're able to keep a look at because we're getting live images from the vessel 24-7. We're then also getting a lot of telemetry data. So we're receiving things like AIS signals from, uh, from nearby vessels. We're, we're, we're recording all sorts of, of, of met ocean parameters. Uh, we're getting a whole suite of data and that information is provided to our, what we call USV pilots. Um, and that is then passed through what we call a cyber deck, which is then displaying all of this information. So we're giving the, 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 the USV pilot back on shore really a very rich experience in terms of the information feeds that they would have if they were on the vessel. And then there's a third uh, feed of data that we're providing, and that's actually all around the data that we're collecting. So we typically would have two people during a survey operation. One is the pilot. He's effectively the captain of the vessel, responsible for collision avoidance, responsible for the safe navigation of the vessel. And then uh, then we have a second person that's on, and what they're responsible for is the data. So they're basically logged into the multi-beam system, the sub-bottom profile, or whatever whatever application we're using. And they're uh, basically, it's, if they were on the vessel, they're basically checking the data as it's being collected, making any adjustments that are necessary uh, to collect really high-quality data, potentially talking to the pilot and saying, actually, I'd like to go back and do that section again. Uh, the pilot can then plan a route back and then they can resurvey an area a second time. Um, so it's very much that there's there's people that are in the loop all the time. Um, the uh, interestingly in this world of, of COVID, obviously our team aren't in the control room, they're all they're all at home. And what we've found is that it's a really good transition that we're able to have a team of USB pilots, a team of surveyors quite often in different countries. Um, as I say, we're currently one of our vessels out in the North Sea. Uh, the pilots that are on shift at the moment uh, are here in Ireland, um, but actually the guys doing the data analysis, the data checking, they're actually over in the UK. So as long as people have a good uh, internet connection, they're able to access the system through a, through a secure uh, connection that we provide them. And they're then able to interact with the system really anywhere. So it really takes us away from needing to put people in the office. And, and as, as I say, as of today, it's a, it's a, it's a huge advantage. And just to give you an idea of what, what sort of images do the pilots see, um, this is basically it. They see a lot of waves and they see a lot of sky. Um, and, and they're able to get really good definition on, on any, any uh, objects that they may have out there. Um, so that's, uh, that information is fed through to them. We, we also black box it, so we record and store all of our image data, all of our telemetry data, and that means that we can always go back and have a look at uh, events if we want to go and see, uh, see certain items. So I guess moving on a little bit then into the world of regulation, 
Um, regulation is a is a really interesting place because really right now there's no specific legislation around the use of of autonomous or unmanned systems, but there's a wide acceptance that these are coming. They're very real and and therefore they need to be managed. So certainly at an international level, at an IMO level. Uh, there's a safety committee that is looking specifically at, at unmanned systems, mass uh, marine autonomous uh, ships. Um, that process is, is ongoing. Um, but in the, in the interim period, what countries are doing is each national jurisdiction is, is really adopting their own approach to how to manage it. So the example I'm going to give you is how we operate within the UK. It's pretty similar to how every other country is, is adopting it although some of them have slightly different, different approaches. Um, but looking at it in a, in a UK example, how do we go about planning one of these missions and, and getting ourselves on the water and going? So uh, as, as with any type of marine operation, a lot of planning. Um, so before we, we get anywhere near the water, we go through a, a series of documents that we prepare. The first are very obvious, so method statements and risk assessments. So, what are we planning to do? Where are we planning to do it? You know, what risks could be associated with it? How can we mitigate those risks? And that document would basically describe the, the whole mission from when our vessel would leave uh, the workshop, um, ready to go to site, to be launched, to then go out to the site, do the mission, come back and then get returned. Alongside that, we, we also plan for emergencies. So we have an emergency response plan. What would we do in the different scenarios that could occur uh, and make sure that we have, we've planned for them. And then obviously we need to notify people that of our intentions of what we're doing. So we issue a notice to mariners, we draft a notice to mariners. What we then do, um, as I say, in the UK context, it, it would be the MCA that we would then share this document with for review and comment. Um, very similar to all other jurisdictions. These are the key documents that we then share with the regulator. We explain to them what we want to do. We explain to them how we're mitigating the risks. What would we do if there's an emergency uh, and who we want to notify? We take any feedback that we have, um, we update the documents, uh, and then effectively we issue those documents to the re relevant parties, particularly the notice to mariners, making sure that everybody from you know, the harbour authorities through to the lighthouse uh, boards through to the you know local fishermen, the other marine stakeholders, and make sure everybody's fully aware that we're we're undertaking this task. In some instances, even go to issuing radio navigation warnings that are broadcast. Um, uh, that's less so often now, uh, but depends on the area that we're operating. That may be that may be required. And then what about what about registration? Um, so again, I'm talking here primarily in a UK context, it, it is different for each jurisdiction. And what, what we do for each of our vessels is we apply for a, a UK load line exemption. Um, and what that requires is the vessel to undergo a survey. Um, we then identify all of the, all the parameters, physical parameters about the vessel. And then we get issued with an exemption from the load line and, and a series of conditions. And the conditions are the sort of conditions that would be expected. So to operate as an unmanned vessel, um, we're surveying, we carry no cargo, um, but it will be supervised by trained operators. That's obviously key. Um, in terms of the sea state limits, so we've set a limit of sea state six on the vessel, so qu quite quite high sea state. Um, we've operated in those sea states without any, without any issues. Um, and the fact that we have to go through an annual survey. So uh, fairly typical conditions that would be uh, applied on this, uh, on this documentation. And as I say, in, in each jurisdiction, there can be subtle differences between how, how the local regulator will, will address this, uh, but ultimately it comes down to very similar plan the, plan the mission, share the planning, uh, and then implement it through lots of notification. So I think, as I say, probably the most interesting thing is to share with you some examples of what have, what have we used these vessels for? Um, and uh, some of the applications. So um, the first one I was going to step on to is, um, is offshore wind. Um, at this stage, we, we've operated on multiple offshore wind farms. Um, really, I think there's a really good marriage between this type of technology and offshore wind. Offshore wind have 
most offshore wind developers have got have got a name to reduce the number of people that are offshore. Um, so unmanned systems, remote systems really play into that. Um, also, you know, ultra low carbon emissions, and, and ultimately that marries very well with, with offshore wind. And of course, you know, we're trying to deliver our data at, at a lower cost, and, and that's that's helpful as well. So at this stage, we we would have operated uh, around many of the offshore wind farms, particularly around the UK. Um, what sort of activities have we undertaken? Um, probably two types mainly. The first one is, is really all around the sort of seabed surveying. So primarily looking at things like scour around the foundations of wind turbines, particularly in areas where there's high, high mobility. Also doing uh, uh, surveys for pre-jackup. So before a jackup is brought in to, to perform maintenance, we have to survey the seabed and check, uh, check the, the status. Um, we can even look at things like uh, cable entries. We can pick up the, the detail of the cable going in and out of the J tubes uh, and, and give information around that. So really high resolution imagery of the of the seabed. And then the other thing that we spend quite a lot of time doing is looking under the seabed. So this is primarily looking at uh, buried cables. Um, so using sub bottom profilers to penetrate uh, into the seabed. And actually detect the depth of burial of, of cables. Um, what this requires is, is, is a large number of crossings. So uh, in, the, in the image at the top that I have here, the schematic, you can see the, 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 the cable or the pipeline is, is going along across the page and we have to then do a series of crossings. The, the USB being small actually has a big advantage here in that it's, it can turn really sharp. So the ability to do multiple crossings Ultimately, it's a robot. This is the sort of thing it really, really likes. Is something that's that's something that's lots and lots of repeats. That, to be honest, for a for a human can get quite boring, um, but for a robot, program it and it will follow it to you know centimetric accuracy. Um, it's uh, it's really the sort of thing it really excels at. So, and in these examples, we're we're measuring, let's say, the depth of burial of the cable, and, and they're able to then determine whether there's you know there's a risk that they're starting to get eroded. The second area of, of work that we've undertaken quite a lot of is around civil hydrography. So this is really looking at very large areas of survey, and that information is typically used to update the hydrographic charts. Um, the data requirements here are, are very high, and we've completed a lot of work in the UK uh, and also most recently in Canada. Um, this is, a, this is a, a picture of the area that we surveyed in, in northern at Lake Superior just before Christmas um, is around about 800 uh, kilometers square of seabed. Um, we were using some interesting techniques here. Um, right now, as I would have said, this is a this is effectively a, a remote system, so it's fully manned. It's just the crew are on shore. Um, but technology is moving forward, and one of the techniques we deployed here is to say rather than ask the surveyor to predict what is the next best survey line to get the most efficient data collection, what about the system being able to predict what the next best survey line is? So effectively have all the survey planning driven by the system. Um, so we worked uh, on implementing that and integrating that to our autopilot. So large areas of this survey were completed with two USBs and they were basically predicting their next survey line and driving to that survey line for days, day after day after day. So ultimately, in that instance, the USB pilot that's responsible for the vessel is keeping a lookout, making sure that the vessel is safe. Um, but the survey itself is is autonomous; it's driving itself and adjusting itself to make sure it's got the the optimum the optimum survey uh, schedule. Um, this this project was quite challenging because. The time of year we finished uh, in early December. That time of year, a lot of icing in the area, so we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of ice that was forming on the vessel. Uh, we actually had problems with the harbors freezing up. Um, lots of challenges, and and this was this was partly because this was a test to see how would the vessel operate in Arctic conditions. Um, what we found, we found a couple of lessons learned that we're implementing into the design, um, particularly around just uh, just uh, sea ice uh, managing to. Uh, just collect around the gantry where we've got say things like air inlets. Um, so we've we've made some small changes to some of the architecture of the vessel around that. 
um, but very minimal changes. What we did find is, is that because it's so low in the water, because it has very little top size, we really were very unaffected by the amount of ice that was building up and we were able to continue operating for, for weeks uh, with the two vessels without any issues. So it was a really good test for the technology in a particularly difficult time of year in that part of the world. The, the next example that I wanted to share is, is a little bit of a different type of survey. Um, so this is a project that we would have completed for BP on, uh, on at least uh, four occasions now. Um, the, the objective here is to upload sensor data from uh, the seabed, um, sensors that have been placed around, uh, around the seabed in one of the oil fields. And, and there's a need to go and collect that data. The way that data is collected is using an acoustic a modem, a through water modem, it's actually a USB-L system, uh, and to perform that update. So Sonodyne are, are, the, uh, are the company that would have put the sensors in, and they also provide the communications uh, uh, equipment to connect to it and upload it. Um, so this is a good example of well, what does an offshore mission look like for an unmanned system? Well, in this example, we would have uh, delivered the boat to Peterhead, um, so a little bit north of the Aberdeen branch, um, there, the vessel would have been launched either by a slipway or by a crane. Um, when it's in the water, one of the things that we do do is we recognise that in, in our risk assessment, the harbour environment is an area where there can be a lot of, a lot of different conflicting users of, of, of the harbour. There can also be people with less experience operating in the region. So what we do in that uh, circumstance is we say, well, what we'll do is we'll escort the USB out of the harbour out to really the harbour limits, at which point that's when we'll hand over control to the, to the pilots that are managing the vessel via satellite. Um, so in this instance, the Peterhead Harbour Authority would, uh, would support us. We'd have one of our technicians on board the harbour pilot. They would be driving the USB, much like a radio control boat, to, to get it clear out of the harbour environment, and then we would have handed over. And then for, for, for this project, a long transit, so operating about just under 130 nautical miles offshore in the central North Sea. Um, takes around about 40 hours to get there, it's relatively, relatively slow. And then once we're there, we're then able to position ourselves over each of these beacons um, and then start to upload this data. Again, it's a good example of, of, of I, I guess, distributed workforce. So, We've completed this project for BP. We've also completed similar projects for Shell out on the Ormond Langer field in Norway. Um, in that project, not one of our not one of our teams stepped foot in Norway. We actually sent the USV by freight. It was then launched by a local contractor for us. Um, but then, when we were operating it, we were piloting it from Ireland. We had the team from Sonodyne in the UK that were connected through our vessel to their subsea sensors. The data that we were getting, we were sharing with the, the, the Shell team that were in Norway and in Houston, and, and all of this could happen in real time. So, you know, the ability to have a very connected and very, uh, a very widely distributed team really paid for itself, and, and not one person had to get on an aeroplane or travel or, or go offshore to, to, to collect that data. So it really is quite transformational in terms of a different way of working. But back to this uh, project uh, in the North Sea, once all the data is collected, it's relatively small packets of data. So we send that back over the satellite, we check that the data is, uh, is fully competent. And then when we sign that off, the vessel then can, uh, can reverse its course and then can make its way back. It arrives off Peterhead to be, a, to be met, rendezvoused by the Harbour Authority. We then escort it back into the harbour, back to the, the crane and then on its trailer and then off to the next project. So that gives you a bit of a flavour of how how these types of projects work. Just giving a little bit more information of some of the some of the additional challenges that we we find when we're doing this type of mission. So, as I mentioned, this project uh, in the North Sea, around about 130 nautical miles offshore. Um, the first time we did it, we actually had in the restricted area another vessel that was actually performing well intervention tasks. Um, so, a very large vessel. Uh, the actual sensor that we wanted to get the data from was pretty much directly underneath its bow. Um, so what that required is us to then start to work on a SIMOPS plan um, to make sure that we could access the restricted area. We could get into a position where we needed to be uh, to collect our data whilst not interfering with the works that were going on with the, uh, the well intervention vessel. Um, 
we completed all of that. And again, no people on our on our vessel. All of this is done then uh, using using our team that are based on shore in constant communication with the other vessels and, and ensuring that the mission went went successfully first time. So really the final example I was going to share was really around, around a lot of asset integrity work. So one of the things that we can use the USV for is collecting very high definition symmetry data um, on the seabed. So in the picture we have here, this is, this is looking at very high resolution uh, analysis of pipelines. And I, ultimately we're looking here for any debris, any movement, uh, any areas where there's been scour and there are free spans, uh, anything untoward with the, uh, with the pipeline. Um, and so this is work that we complete uh, very frequently for, for a number of different clients. Um, and I was going to finish up with just a little bit of video here uh, of a project that we completed out in Trinidad um, and about a year ago, actually. Um, this project was to actually do a survey um, of the seabed for, for some installation works of pipes. Um, and it gives a good example, again, of how the vessel is handled and operated. So in, in, in the in the section where at the moment the vessel was launched by a crane. Um, again, we would have escorted it out of the harbour with a support boat. Um, and then it would have gone, gone out to the survey area and would have started to complete the survey operations. Um, we covered quite a large area of the seabed, which ranged from relatively shallow water, you know, into the uh, you know, very uh, sort of five, six metres, right out to around 40 metre uh, contour and two different areas. Um, and the USV was over there for um, you know, four and a half days, completed a large number of survey lines um, before it was then taken back out of the water, put back into the shipping container. And actually, from there, it went back to Canada, um, where it then started other survey work and then back to the Gulf of Mexico for survey work. So that uh, that was everything that I had in my in my slides there. So I don't know, John, if you're uh, if you're still there, and um, I haven't looked yet to see whether we've got any questions, and uh, or uh, hopefully I haven't put everybody to sleep on this uh, on this evening. No, no, not at all, James. I think um, that was actually an excellent presentation, and uh, trust me, I've been I've been watching this. There's lots of uh, questions as well, so so uh, we'll we'll be able to get to those. But I, so I kind of wanted to give a bit of a uh, give a synopsis. So, because I thought it was a great presentation and, and really interesting, and I like the fact that you, you started off talking about the fact that you know you, you consider yourself to be more of a, a data company as much as anything else, um, because I guess it's about the data acquisition. And uh, I know you kind of touched on Tesla a couple of times, and I was, I was racking my brains, and, and I found a quote, and I think it was Elon Musk, who uh, compared, he, he said the Model S car is not a car but a sophisticated computer on wheels. So it sounds. Yeah almost as a similarity there, like, you know, this isn't a, a, a boat, it's a, it's a sophisticated floating computer, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think that's a really good point. And, and, and the fact that it, it, uh, it allows itself to be disruptive uh, by doing something completely different and working in a different way, it, uh, it enables environmental uh, benefits from lower emissions, uh, safety benefits by, you know, removing people from sea, which, you know, I guess that, you know, that, that, that is a safety aspect. And, uh, but also it's, it's allowing for this uh, distributed uh, sort of workforce uh, to be able to, to work regardless of location. So it was like, um, for me again, it's a, a, probably two years ago, you know, it's one of those sort of environments where people sort of go, oh, well, could that work? Whereas now, known in, in, in a pandemic environment, we know that works very effectively and actually yeah. we see that there's far more benefits to it. So it was yeah. interesting, you were kind of doing this stuff quite a, quite a while ago and, uh, and what it does now is just kind of reinforces when, when people are kind of jolted into doing these things. So I think for me, it really touched a lot of points. I'm just scribbling on my notes here, something anything else there. Uh, but no, I just thought it was great. And, um, and also I think the final thing I noticed is, is the enabling technologies that you talked about, you know, about the technologies that, that currently um, uh, exist that really allowed you to accelerate the deployment uh, of this. Yeah. But, you know, it's, and, and that's why I think it's great because like, it takes, you know, sort of some companies the opportunity to sort of uh, use different techniques and bundle them together in order to create a market advantage. And, uh, and I really think that's what, uh, what you guys have done. So. It's, it's great to hear that coming through in the presentation. Right now, right. there is loads of questions. So oh, <laughs> I thought I was going to get off lightly. 
No way, no way. Well, we've got 10 past. I think we've easily got 20 minutes of questions. So I'm going to start from the top. And uh, this is from Anonymous. Um, and uh, as I said, how do you uh, deal with jurisdiction issues uh, for operating the vessels in a different region from the location of the remote operator? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, and, and what we find is ultimately it comes down to the qualification of the pilots. So there have been instances where we've been operating in a jurisdiction where they would ask us to, uh, to make sure that the pilots that are managing the vessel have qualifications for that jurisdiction. Um, the, uh, it also then comes back to things like the flag state of the vessel. So where is the vessel flagged and therefore what qualifications does that flag state require for those mariners? So, um, so it, again, this all comes back into the planning phase. So when we're planning the mission, that's where we would look at, well, where are we operating? What, what constraints may be put on us in terms of the qualifications for the pilots and make sure we're then addressing that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one, of the, one of the many things on the checklist when we're planning a project. Okay, and I guess that kind of leads on to another point because like there was a question that says like, you know, what trainings do your operators undertake? So, so you kind of touched on it there. It, does it, what, what do you need to study or, or do in order to become a, a pilot? Yeah, so uh, again, this is a really interesting point. And I think, you know, it's about, I suppose, the, the changing nature of the mariner. Um, so what we find, so in terms of most regulators, the way they look at it is they say, they, they look to, for you to have qualifications that would be equivalent for that size of vessel. So it's a really small vessel. So typically um, it's relatively low in terms of it's not it's not your sort of your master's tickets that they're looking for. It's more, I mean, you know, a commercial yacht master is 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 something that's seen as a as a, you know an acceptable qualification. So that's where it would start and then move work its way up. But what we typically find is that you know ultimately ultimately we're not replacing mariners. What we're doing is is we're changing the environment that, that, that a lot of our mariners are working in. So what we find is a lot of people that have been at sea for many years um, and actually want to look at an opportunity to stay being a mariner, but actually do it from home. Um, this is the new world. And uh, so we find that we have a lot of people that are ex, uh, you know, commercial mariners that are effectively, you know, moving into a different arena, but then bringing those marine skills to the table. Right. No, that's a very good point. Like, you know, and I guess it's, um, it's, it's about understanding the environment, but also having the opportunity to be able to work in that environment whilst almost in a in a in a, in a onshore location. So, like, uh, almost the best. Of both. I, mm -hmm. I think it's the same also for the you know for the surveyors as well. Is that you know the surveyors they get to a point that getting on a boat for another two weeks to to stare at a laptop you know isn't that attractive anymore. Well, if you can do the same the same activity, but you can do it from home. Um, uh, you, you touched also on the you touched also on the point around you know being able to bring in distributed people we've had many instances where for example the you know the provider of a sonar a multi-beam system you know they've actually had a bug um we've been able to bring the developer live onto the vessel through a secure connection and say look this is what this is what we're seeing and typically what they find is that normally the a survey company comes back to shore and says that sonar system wasn't working and they go well can't fix it. Whereas we can bring them on live and show them this is what's not working, and they're able to go, ah, now I understand it. Yeah, we'll have that fixed. So um, I think being able to bring in people externally live in a live environment is really valuable. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. It brings on that. It's almost that 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 multiple platform use as well. Like you know, yeah. I often lament that how much my kids play, um, you know, Fortnite and and. Uh, and uh, on these online games, but I suppose in some respects, that's that's a kind of a connected workforce of the future yeah. as well. You know, that's, that's how you're using technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. uh, so as Robert Dory, you asked uh, that question, particularly around uh, the operators of the craft ensuring yeah. compliance. Uh, Andy Rose, uh, great question. If you um, if your control signal gets lost, uh, what action does the USB take? So you lose. Sorry, you know, that, that, if you lose comms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, so it's a great question, Andy. Um, the um, so we we program it for these eventualities. So and what I say is so the first thing we do is we have what's called a heartbeat between our system onshore and the vessel. So we're constantly checking that the vessel is in comms with us. If 
we lose that heartbeat, we know we've, we've lost comms because one of the first challenges with the system is to know, you know, when did your internet stop working? Um, it's, uh, so you need to know that. So we, we're constantly monitoring the, the, the quality of the signal. If we do find that there's something wrong, the first and most obvious thing is to stop. We don't want a vessel charging around the sea, uh, not in control. So the most obvious thing to stop is to stop. However, there are certain circumstances when actually stopping is not the right thing to do. So in, in, for example, if we're crossing a, a traffic separation scheme or something like that, what we'll do is we'll program the vessel to say, if for one of some reason, the, the communications were to drop out, don't stop, continue to a position and stop there. So basically get yourself out of the, uh, out of the area in and go to somewhere safe. So we can program it in that scenario to do that. Um, but the other thing as well is to have multiple comms channels. So typically we might be using a, an Inmarsat system for our primary broadband, but we then have a secondary Iridium system on board, um, slightly lower bandwidth, so it's slightly less rich in terms of experience, but it allows us to do all the things like um, send it off to a waypoint, speed it up, slow it down, turn it to port, turn it to starboard, um, reset various systems on board, you know, diagnose faults. So we, we have a, effectively a backdoor into the vessel that allows us to, to, to address that. So, so in simple answer, we know, it's, we know that the connection is stopped and we've programmed it to tell it what to do if that was to happen. Very good, yeah. So you're building in the redundancy, but also then the, 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 the fail stops as well. So, so yeah. you're one scenarios. So that's really good. Excellent. Um, so uh, we've got a question here from Anonymous. Uh, I'm sure there are exciting moments, but how do you ensure the remote pilot stays awake at less interesting times? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, ultimately, I guess this is a problem that, uh, that, that lots, of, uh, lots of marine users face is, uh, you know, on your particularly long passage, it's late at night and it's, there's nothing around you. It, it can get a bit monotonous. Um, so actually what we do is we have all sorts of things on the system. To, so we do all the things that you would do on a normal vessel. So we do a lot of log keeping. So we're making sure that the logs are kept. So that, that keeps people's focus. Um, we also have the ability to, to basically check that, you know, aircraft do the same thing. If, if there's a worry in, in the aviation industry that the pilot has got hypoxia and so therefore it's passed out. Um, so what they do is they look for key, key, key switches. So if somebody has clicked a button in the last 30 seconds, well, obviously the pilot's awake. So, so what we do is we can monitor to make sure that the system is being interacted with to make sure that people are staying in control and on top of it. But, uh, but yeah, um, a lot of it's also about the supervision. So with people working remotely, what we do is we have a network where effectively the guys are always on a, in, in our world, it's a Teams call. They're all connected, all the pilots, and they're chatting away in the middle of the night about which boat they're on and what they're up to, and uh, they're keeping that bit of camaraderie going. I like to say it's it's twenty four seven, but people don't work. Uh, individuals aren't working twenty four seven. They they'll have shift yeah. patterns as well. So they'll correct. Work. Yeah. But uh, no, that's good. And uh, okay, so uh, Simon Milliard, uh, as well as resilient GNSS. Uh, what other aids to navigation do you think autonomous ships will benefit from? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, using the the satellite positioning system is obviously a primary a primary input. I mean, all of the work we do is in the commercial sphere. We don't we don't do any work in the in the defence sector where there could be sort of GPS denied uh, type scenarios. Where I know there there are techniques there for you know using various techniques for. Um, um, basically dead reckoning using things like your uh, your position over the, over the seabed and to actually calculate your position. So we, we don't really use that. What we do is we have we have multiple redundant GPSs on board. So we have have basically a vessel system, but we also then have a very high grade survey system. So that's giving us you know, really centimetric accuracy on our on our positioning. So um, so really for us it's about having multiple feeds for the system and then and then yeah managing it that way. Okay, no, okay, that's a good point. I had to admit, I hadn't heard of that myself, so it's, uh, it's, it's a insightful input there, you know. Um, right, so another question from Anonymous, still the same person, but uh, we'll see. Uh, what limitations are there in terms of uh, safe navigation of the USV in compliance uh, with call regs, uh, particularly in relation to larger uh, unmanned vessels? So, you know, you're, you're, you're over 500 
thousand tons. Yeah, I mean, and I think this is this is a really interesting. You know, I mentioned I think at the start that the the IMO are looking at at, at, at things like coal rates around you know and solas and marpol and all the other statutory instruments to understand well we're moving into a, a world of unmanned systems. How how do those statutory instruments work? Um, the the so obviously they're going to do their work and they're going to make their decisions as to how they see that. Um, ultimately, what we've tried to do in our system is really have equivalence. So you know. We don't have a watch keeper on board the vessel keeping a lookout, but therefore let's put somebody in a control room with that same information and let's have the equivalence to it. So, so really everything we've tried to do is to give ourselves that, that sort of equivalence to what somebody would have if they were on board the vessel. Um, I think when you get to much larger systems, I mean, we're ultimately about you know, 750 kilograms, four and a half meters, you know, we're, we're, we're smaller than the ship's lifeboat. Um, you know, ultimately we pose probably very little risk to, particularly once you get offshore to larger, larger uh, seafarers. Um, but as the vessels get larger, then the risks change. Um, so, you know, one of the things we could look at is things like cybersecurity. So we've got very robust uh, systems to protect us from, you know, being being hacked effectively. Um, so we we put in very stringent measures around that. But the consequences of us being hacked is nothing like the consequences of an oil tanker being hacked and taken over. So I think it is difficult for the IMO when they're looking at the different uh, sizes of vessels and the different types of applications to come up with rules that are going to be common. I, I personally think that they should potentially look at it on a risk-based approach. You know, small vessels that are going slow are a different risk to very large vessels that are going fast. Um, and I think potentially there should be some sort of distinction between that. Yeah, no, and it, it does raise a very interesting point and, uh, and most likely uh, a position that the IMO will have to take up more. And that, uh, that sort of offshore cyber piracy is going to become, you know, sort of far more uh, prevalent, you know, in, in an environment yeah. where we have more either autonomous or, or remotely operated uh, service vessels. Okay, so um, uh, Alistair Hart has a question here. Uh, do you have your own USV construction assembly facility? Yeah, we, we actually we actually outsource uh, the production of our mm. of our USVs. Um, so what we've tried to do as a business is focus on where we think we can add some value, and we we figured out, we figured pretty early that we wouldn't be very good at building boats. So we uh, we asked people that are good at building boats to do it for us. So uh, we're we're just currently building the eleventh at the moment um, and, um, and, uh, and and actually we do have a, a new design that's coming out in the next few weeks um, that we're going to be launching shortly which has got a little bit more a, a little bit more capacity and capability that we'll, we'll unveil soon um, but yeah so what we do is we really focus on we design the system we outsource the production of it and then we own and operate them so we don't actually sell our systems to third parties we we own all of our vessels and we operate them and, and we feel that that's important because it is a complex system it's a complex environment to operate in and we feel most comfortable ma looking managing the systems that we've designed sure yeah no i think that makes sense so i guess jerry mcmahon has a bit of a almost like a follow-up to that so what kind of servicing is required for the usvs and what is the range of operation or the maximum time at sea yeah so ma maximum of time at sea it's all down to it's all down to a power balance so how much uh, you know if we're if we're using our thrusters and all of our systems as, as much as possible we're, we're down to about three weeks maximum uh, time offshore if we if we want to do for example some some projects we look at we go and position ourselves offshore somewhere to collect say some net ocean data and use very little power we can stay there for months if we do that so very much depends on what we're doing but typically interestingly what we have found is the reason for coming back to shore is one of two reasons. Either we see some pretty nasty weather coming in, and you know, if you're seeing a, if you're seeing 50 knots of wind and some some pretty nasty seas, there's really no point staying out there. You're just putting the system at risk for no reason. Um, the main reason we come back to port though is 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 for data dumps. Um, so whereas normal vessels come back in for uh, you know port calls, crew changes, reprovision. We come into port primarily to drop the data off because we've collected, you know, gigabytes, if not terabytes of data. We want to start processing that. So 
Typically, we come back in maybe once a week would be a typical schedule. Come back in, we offload the data. What we then do is we, we then refuel the, the diesel generator um, to make sure we've got that full. If we need to do servicing, we, we typically do generator services, so that's oil changes, filter changes, at uh, periodic intervals. Um, we also have to do some servicing on the thrusters, um, things like that, but it's all very routine type of, of servicing. But really, the main reason to come back to port is, is actually dropping the data. Right, okay. And uh, I guess, you know, because the durations are offshore, you can, you can plan the, the maintenance yourself in when the, when the vessels are, are actually back. And do you, do you do that vessels or do you outsource that as well? Yeah, so interestingly, we used to do, pre-COVID, we used to do all of this. Whenever we had a project, we would send the vessel with a field ops team. So, uh, you know, one or two uh, of the team that would take the vessel by road, they would then launch it, they would then provide any maintenance requirements that were needed during the project. COVID has changed all that. What we're finding more and more often is that we're, we're as some of our clients like to say, we, we post the USV, um, we send a container with the vessel to wherever it's going in the world. And then what we do is we find that a local partner that's able to receive the vessel, take it out of the, the, the shipping container, um, fuel it up, launch it, escort it in and out of the harbour. And they're also able, so typically we're looking for very general marine skills. So uh, primarily it's things like the generator servicing. So it's a diesel mechanic that's uh, that, that we can find really everywhere. So more and more we're finding that we're identifying mm -hmm. partners uh, around the world that can perform their services for us. And, and our team, less and less travel for our team. Yeah, and that's a good thing as well. Like, you know, again, because what you're doing is you're, you're, you're minimizing the amount of travel, the amount of effects that has on, on people as well. So yeah, yeah. And it, 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 uh, it, it's interesting how it's able to, um, you know, sort of um, meet the requirements that were being pushed into at the moment as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions from Tony Duncan as well. Um, you Have you had any issues with IP for third party uh, equipment, software and survey packages being used through your digital platform? I'm not that I'm aware of. I, I can't think of any, any instances that we've had. Um, no, no, that's not something that we've encountered. Good, good. And uh, there was another one. Uh, have you had, this from Simon uh, Milliard again, have you had one pilot managing more than one vessel, I guess, at a time? Uh, yes, it, that, that, that's a really good question because I think what that moves to is, well, where is the technology heading? Um, so right now, no, we, we've, we've always had one-to-one -one relationships. So one, one mariner, Looking after one USB, and, and we've had, we've been very kind of clear on that. Um, however, we're developing the system is designed to be monitored, but we've built in a lot of technology into the system. So the the the, the USB itself is actually it's actually processing all of the images that it's collecting, looking for things like targets. We've got lidars on board looking for for potential hazards. We've got you know, data that's telling us, is there an AIS target within a certain range? Is there a closest point of approach, a CPA risk with, with a vessel? All of that is actually being processed. So, so the technology is more than capable of moving to a situation where it's not the pilot watching the vessel, but the vessel telling the pilot that there's something to see, something to look at. And, and, and then the next step is to say, well, okay, there's a vessel in that position, the obvious thing to do here is, is to stop and wait for it to pass or turn to port, turn to starboard. Um, building that logic in is, is very straightforward. Right now, I don't think the, the world or the regulation or the or we're not at the point to, to start using that technology, but it's it's absolutely possible. And it's I think long term, if I was to look out 10 years from now, I think you know the vessels could be could be fully autonomous but then overseen by a team of mariners that are making sure that they're they are doing the right thing and that they're operating correctly so so there's definitely the technology there to make it a lot more autonomous but but not just yet right now it's, it's, it's an interesting point where almost you get to the point where the the vessel is, is telling the pilot what what to, what to look out for and what to see which i suppose yeah. is, again is appropriate use of the of the equipment and the technologies that are available you know and yeah. uh, and also, they're the vessel that's on site, you know, and 
from a peripheral vision almost perspective yeah. it's so much more that the vessel will be able to tell you that uh, the operator can can feed off then you know yeah um okay uh okay anonymous asks how long does a shift last for each mariner yeah so we operate three eight hour shifts um and um and we've, we've we've always done it that way interestingly we know that certainly on a lot of vessels they're perhaps more used to 12 hour shifts um we've we've adopted eight hours and that's uh, yeah. that's that's what we do good and uh comfort breaks included <laughs> yeah exactly and that's where to be honest, having having a network of the pilots all online at the same time means that you know you can have a supervisor that can just take over one of the vessels from another pilot if they need a break, or you know we can provide that sort of fluid exchange throughout the team. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's just in some respects mimicking just an onshore perspective what often happens offshore anyhow. Yeah. So okay, so Tony, uh, there's another question here. What restrictions or issues have you had with real-time data transfer rates uh, for survey instrumentation uh, for real-time operations? I assume you're using MRS, which uh, which you are. Yeah. So um, the bandwidth is is a you know when you're operating satellite controlled systems, bandwidth is always one of the. There's bandwidth and latency. Um, what we find is the latency isn't such a problem. Um, particularly when you're using an Iridium system where, where it's a lower orbit, orbit satellite, so therefore you get, you get a lot less pause when you're interacting with the system. Um, the bandwidth is a, is, is, is a continual kind of battle. What, what we have at the moment, and I think this is really the state of the art at the moment, is we're able to see the data that we're collecting. We're able to even run processing. You, you quite rightly, John, say that this, this is a floating computer. So we actually do data processing on that floating computer, as well as acquiring the data, we process some of the data on board. So we can do all of that. The one thing we can't do is bring the raw data back to shore, just because you know, we're, we're, we're going from you know, connection that's, than, that's less, than, less than megabytes to needing to transmit terabytes of data that the order of magnitude is so, so great. Um, so, but what we can do is we can do, so for example, we've, we've quite often done surveys where we do a survey and the client needs the data, you know, really urgently, really quickly. So we actually do basic processing on the vessel offshore, and then we just bring back the results uh, to over the satellite. So you're bringing back a relatively small amount of data, which is telling you the important information you need. Now, as I say, enabling technologies, you know, satellite technology is going to keep keep developing you know will we ever be in the only problem is the sensors are getting hungrier and hungrier in terms of the amount of data they can collect so i'm not quite sure ever the satellite bandwidth will be able to keep up with the volume of data being generated um, but certainly with some of the new satellite systems that are coming on board we can start to repatriate lots of the data but i'm a big fan of offshore processing why why are we bringing the data ashore we've got a floating computer Let's just process the data on the on the floating computer. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Like you know, again, you're you're saving time, and uh, particularly sometimes you you need that immediate information just to tell you your big ticket items and the make a decision. Uh, yeah, yeah, the major post processing to to give you all the nuances. But you know, yeah, uh, standard answers to be there. Um, okay, so what have we got? Uh, uh, Robert Dory's got a question. Uh, do you have availability? Uh, for short notice survey requirements within the UK, such as a shipwreck, uh, such as a, as, a, as a wreck location? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the answer is yeah. I mean, interestingly, we did a job um, just uh, just last week for a, for a client um, just off uh, just off Lowestoft. And, uh, we, you know, we from the phone call to being mobilized, I think it was something like 48 hours. It was it was it was a very short period of time to be actually then out on the water survey, getting the data required. So. Um, interestingly, one of the things we've spoken to some of the lighthouse boards about is is actually around wreck identification and wreck marking. Um, so, you know, the classic problem of of a, of a vessel that has sunk. First of all, you know, often it's not well recorded exactly the position. Uh, there was more of a panic at the time, and so first thing is to go and identify it. Um, and so, obviously, you can use multi beam or side scan techniques to find it. But we've got a system on the vessel which is called Station Keep, which is it's kind of like a DP mode. Um, ultimately, we can park ourselves over that position then um, for however long it takes to then mobilize a, a, 
you know a vessel to come and deal with the uh, deal with the wreck so or put a permanent mark on it so um we've never actually we've spoken to a number of the, the boards about it. it it's it's entirely doable um it's just not something we've never actually ended up doing yet so okay so there's some uh, there's some shipwreck uh adventures to come in the future yeah yeah Right, yeah, it's good, good idea as well. Uh, okay, so Daniel has a question here. Uh, what can national regulators authorities do to improve research in the areas of USVs and ASVs, uh, designated test bed areas, etc.? So, is, is there anything different that the authorities, uh, regulators, really could do to try and encourage more research in this area? I mean, I, I think I think a lot of the regulators are, are doing it, and I, and I think really the key is is enabling you know, responsible operations. Um, you know, we, we we try and position ourselves in a situation where whenever we're going to the regulator to ask about a project we want to do, of not asking them something that we think is going to put them in a difficult place. Um, you know, s serving up and down the you know up and down the Dover Straits. You know. It's probably not a great, not, probably not a great suggestion. Um, so let's not put those sorts of issues in front of them. But I think what the regulators can do is recognise that enabling the ability to get these vessels at sea, so people can learn and get that 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 return of experience, is absolutely essential. I'd say, you know, huge huge credit to certainly the MCA. The MCA have really been leaders in terms of enabling this uh, this activity, and and the result is is that you know, let's be clear, we're we're not the only people that are that are developing unmanned systems and trying to get them to see. Um, there's a whole industry that's developing around this, uh, be it uh, you know, aerial, surface and subsea. Um, it's fantastic to see, but it does need, it does need the regulators to, you know, to, to facilitate that activity happening and for them to learn as well. I think if you spoke to the regulators, they would also say, you know, we, we've, we've fortunately been one of the companies that's probably gone into most reason, regions first. So every time we go into a region first, we're asked by the regulators, so we, we don't even know what questions that they should be asking us. And so, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of two-way education here and, and establishing processes that are sensible. We, you know, we don't want to be taking risks. We don't want to be, you know, pushing the boundaries. What we want to do is do sensible marine operations with a, with a different type of platform. Yeah, no, I totally pragmatic view as well. Absolutely. Uh, so Alistair Hart asks uh, for ship collisions where preliminary damage assessment, both above and below the waterline, may be needed. Any requests for our experience of such in, uh, incidents? So have you ever come across? <laughs> yeah, sort of collision. It's not something that we've been asked to perform in terms of surveys. Interestingly, some of the types of survey that we've done that would be an analogy to this is when you're doing very tight coastal surveys where you're using a multi-beam, looking in um, very, very uh, you know, horizontally at the, at the coastline and then also using a LIDAR above the surface. So you effectively get a, a below water and above water data set. So certainly that type of surveying is possible. Um, it's not something we've been asked to do in terms of surveying vessel, other vessels for, for collisions, but um, uh, but I think that type of that type of survey is possible. Perfect. No, it's really good. Uh, right, Tony Duncan, last the second last question, um, and it's an easy one. How many vessels do you have, and in what regions? Yeah, so we've got nine in service at the moment, but two more in in production. They'll be finished in the next few weeks, actually. So uh, so we'll be up to eleven at that stage. Um, predominantly, we've got two over in North America. The rest of them are all here in, in Europe at the moment, uh, dotted around Ireland and the UK. Um, we've got quite a few in our, we, we've got a, a quite a busy year lined up ahead of us. So we've got quite a few of them back at our workshop at the moment, just getting a, a series of upgrades that we wanted to do to some of the older vessels uh, to give them the latest elements of the technology and uh, get them out to get them out working as soon as possible. So. So yeah, mostly mostly Europe with a few in North America. Very good. No, excellent. And uh, last question, uh, Henrik, uh, from Henrik. What is a backup battery power uh, in case of genset failure? So I guess what, what's a what's a backup battery power? Yeah. So we have um, we have a, a quite a large lithium ion battery on board. So what what we do, and again, it's all about sort of planning for for the what ifs. Um, so what we do is we we typically always keep our main battery pretty much fully charged. 
Um, and the idea being that if you then did have, a, have an issue with the generator, you've then got quite a large electrical reserve to provide you with propulsion, communications, um, and, uh, and, and all the systems uh, while you deal with that. So, you know, if we saw, for example, and, and typically what we do is we're monitoring all of the systems on board. If we see a system have a problem, we typically will say, right, well, let's bring the vessel back. You know, let's not let's not rely on a backup system. Um, you know, so for example, we've got everything is doubled up. Everything is, you know, fuel pumps, coolant pumps, everything that doubles. But whenever we see one of them fail, we'll bring the vessel back. We'll fix that, and then it will go back out with full redundancy available. So, uh, but yeah, a large lithium ion battery is the answer. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. And uh, listen, that's it. The, the last comment is from Alistair Hart again. Thanks, James, for the fascinating presentation. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, join Alistair and uh, and I think the, the rest of the audience who were very vocal on the keyboards anyway with lots of questions. And uh, it's a great presentation. Uh, really well done. Really interesting topic and, uh, and really brought together lots of different aspects. And, you know, it's, it's for me, you know, sort of the marine industry, is, uh, is is all about the blue economy and it's not just about you know sort of oil and gas it's about renewables it's about uh, you know wrecks it's about site surveys it's about hydrographic mapping uh, you know and and so much of what you do tops and all those things so like you know um, along with all the other attendees in the audience I want to um, give you my thanks from the Aberdeen Maritime Branch for taking the time this evening to to come out and talk to us and um, and also. <clears throat> Obviously, at uh, twenty to eight on a on a whatever we are Wednesday evening, yeah. uh, I want to thank all the the viewers as well for for taking the time out of their evening uh, to come out and listen to us as well. Um, it's it's great having uh, these forums. It's a shame we're not live in person uh, at the moment, but hopefully that will uh, that will come about soon. But whilst we we are in in restricted times, then what we'll do is continue to to uh, complete this um, this type of format and uh, and give this type of content. So um, on that point, I guess next month, uh, we'll have uh, the wind turbine control system for floating platforms presentation. So uh, James, you know, you're more than welcome to- Interesting. <laughs> That's gonna be by Mark Thomas at DNVGL. Uh, so, you know, uh, really, uh, James, you set, the, you set the, the tone for 2021 and, uh, and, the, and the caliber of the, of the presentations. But I uh, will try and keep that going. Hopefully we'll keep that going with Mark. And um, one thing uh, I will say as well for, for the audience, what we're going to try and do, hopefully, I'll check behind the scenes afterwards, is uh, for all the, uh, the viewers, uh, we're trying to get a feedback for them. Uh, one of the things we really want to do is we want to find out from the audience how we can make uh, this experience more interesting, better, different for you guys and girls and, and to see really what we can do. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to get those feedback forms and, and, uh, and let us know how you find the presentation, uh, the content and, uh, and anything we can do to improve things. So um, with that, again, James, uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, audience out there, thank you very much as well.